Steve, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Kudos to you all for being here. I want to begin by invoking this epigraph uh, behind us. How good it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in harmony. Because everyone here this evening, we all share exactly the same goal of keeping the planet and our climate safe. I think to touch on the title of tonight's session, uh, there are multiple strategies that can help to achieve that goal. I think that the council member and the senator have done a wonderful job um, articulating how corporate divestment from fossil fuels can contribute to the goal of keeping our planet safe. Uh, there are other strategies as well, and it is those strategies that I chiefly will talk about uh, in my remarks. Uh, before doing so, though, I, I just want to touch briefly, again going back to the title, on why it's worth even having this discussion. I, I think Steve did a very good job uh, laying, the, laying the context for this discussion, but just to go to the title of tonight's session, you know, Financial Strategies uh, to Keep Fossil Fuels in the Ground. Why? You know, why on a Tuesday night when there are plenty of other things to do, is that, is that worth us spending our time uh, focusing on? Uh, to me, to, to, two reasons. One is that we know that we have far more carbon in the ground than we can burn safely. So our organization, the Carbon Tracker Initiative, um, helped to try to launch this discussion back in 2011 uh, when we put out our first unburnable carbon report which Bill McKibben, to his credit, then popularized in Rolling Stone um, and helped really bring this discussion to the forefront. And in that report and our subsequent research, we focused on what we term the carbon budget. I know that council member understands budgets, so the carbon budget being basically the idea that to stay within any safe threshold for climate change, two degrees, two degrees, which is really totally an upper the last, well, as high as we can go, but it's something that's been endorsed by 103 nations, 193 nations in 2010. Uh, to do that, there's a budget of how much fossil fuels we can burn, 900 billion tons of CO2. Uh, and that is, if you look at, okay, so there's this budget for listed fossil fuel companies, the Exxon Mobiles, the Chevrons of the world, um, you know, how does that compare with the, with the listed reserves of these companies? It means that basically, listed companies can burn one-third of their proven reserves. To say nothing of broader category of resources, one-third, one-third. That's, that's two-thirds less than everything. And it's certainly a lot less just out of interest. Uh, scientists at MIT recently calculated that if we burned, you know, we could burn one-third for two degrees. Business as usual, we're probably headed to about four degrees. If we burned everything in the ground, reserves, resources, coal, oil, and gas, uh, we would warm the planet about 9 degrees Celsius, 16 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point Earth would be unrecognizable. So as Steve said when beginning this, this really is you know, a matter of catastrophe that we're, that, that we're, that we're facing here. Uh, and, it's, and it's good to be reminded of that. So that's the too much carbon in the ground. The financial piece basically is relevant because to get all that carbon out of the ground, requires investing a whole lot of money. So the, the International Energy Agency estimates that in sort of a business as usual world, that four degree world, where the world over the next 20 years will invest about a trillion dollars a year in, in digging up, in transporting, and in refining coal, oil, and gas. Of that trillion dollars, uh, at least 200 billion of it is unnecessary, so one fit is unnecessary if we're gonna stay within two degrees, and I would argue probably more than that. Uh, this is our research at Carbon Tracker. We look at financially risky capital expenditures, um, and, and, and I, would, I would note, just for the purpose of this discussion, building on the Senator's points um, about, about you know, um, fiduciary responsibility, there are many good reasons to, to scrutinize these these capital expenditures and getting fossil fuels, even independent of climate. The uh, senator touched on the performance of, of coal stocks. Uh, we've seen the second largest U.S. coal producer, Alpha Natural Resources, file for Chapter 11 earlier this week. The, the sector has been hammered. Um, and, and I would argue that this is indicative of the transformations, climate being only one driver that are going to occur for coal in other countries and also for oil and gas. So there are, very, there are good reasons you know, to be thinking about this financial element, even independent of climate. That's sort of the context. Question, what do we do about it? 
we've heard, I think, uh, compelling, you know, very compelling discussion of the role that divestment can play in addressing those risks. I think we'll hear more from Brad on sort of the, the technical implementation side and, and, and also from, from Geraldine. In the work that our organization does, we often advise uh, or counsel investors who are not going to divest for a variety of reasons, um, often either because sort of generally one of two reasons, or it could be a combination. They, they either um, are not convinced that it will have a sufficient impact on actually changing the behavior of fossil fuel companies, keeping carbon in the ground, um, or because they think that it will, it will either cost them money, either by removing certain investments, changing the style of investing. Um, I, I, can't, I can't speak for any one investor, but I'll, do, I'll just point as part of the discussion to um, a gentleman who is the CIO, the Chief Investment Officer, of CalSTRS, the California State Teachers Retirement System, one of the largest U.S. pension funds, um, who, has, who has been quoted, CalSTRS being a fund that has that divested by, state, by statute from apartheid in the 1980s and then voluntarily from tobacco stocks in the 1990s. And uh, their chief investment officer has, has observed in his view that in both of those instances, divestment cost the state, cost the teacher's pension fund money which is still tracked in their annual reports, and in neither case did it, did it affect the behavior of the companies from which they divested. One perspective, you can evaluate it on, on the merits, but this is, for some spectrum of institutional investors, um, that, would, that would be the view that they have. So the most important point that I'd like to make, which I think the prior speakers have touched on, is that that need not be the end of the discussion, and that there, is, there are many steps that investors can take to address the problem of unburnable carbon, of climate risk, that are uh, other than broad divestment from fossil fuels. I I'm going to touch on two of these strategies, and I think that both Scott, uh, pardon me, and Shanna will be able to, to elaborate on them in their remarks. So I would say that if you're, if you're talking to a pension fund or an endowment, and you're just at loggerheads over this divestment issue, uh, there, there are two things that you should you say you're going to invest in fossil fuels, you know, for, for whatever reason, uh, that's okay. But you should you should want them to do two things. One, to be a smart investor, and and to be what I would call sort of a two degree C aligned investor. And second of all, there should be an engaged investor. So what would it mean to be a smart investor? Well, as as Senator Kruger talked about, being a smart investor would mean, for example, not having been heavily invested in U.S. coal stocks uh, over the past five years. Uh, it, it means looking at fossil fuels. And now the world's energy system, you know, we, we get about 75% of our energy from fossil fuels. Uh, to, to save the climate, that needs to trend downwards. Eventually, it, in 2070, 2060, it needs to go probably to zero. And there are, there are roadmaps to show that. But even in the near term, it needs to begin trending downwards, most particularly for coal. Uh, so there are, different, there are different risk profiles, touching on some of the you know, studying, getting into the weeds uh, that the council member mentioned. There, there are different risk profiles for these different fossil fuels. For those who are interested or have insomnia, uh, check out a paper from University College London, which came out late 2014, which shows by region and for coal, oil, and gas, different the reserves that have to basically be stranded in a two degree scenario. For coal reserves in any country, it's about 75 to 95% of reserves. For natural gas, it ranges from well above 50% in the Middle East to, to about 10% in the US because it's low cost gas, a variety of reasons. Again, that's just one paper, but it shows you that there's, there are differences. And what you want to do, if you're, if you're not divesting, you want to align your portfolio so that you are, if you're going to be invested in fossil fuels, invest in low-cost fossil fuels. Invest in fossil fuels that can be used within a carbon budget. This is, it, it's not, I mean, there is modeling to do this, but there, there certainly, if you're actively managing your portfolio, it can be done. And even there, there are what are called passive investment products, ETFs, um, including ones that we're working on, which, which can help you achieve this goal. So being a smart investor, a two degree C aligned investor, that at a minimum should be, should be an, a step 
um, that any, any organization concerned about climate change should take. Second issue, and this is where I'm going to just give a little teaser. For, I know that the, the, the Comptroller's Office getting a lot of good press here this evening, so I'll, I'll add to that. Uh, about being, this being an engaged investor, I, I think I need to, you know, Senator Kruger gave, I think, what is the most compelling challenge to, to engagement advocates, and I, and I count myself as one of them, which is that the challenge of trying to convince companies to fundamentally change their business models. Um, it's a, it's, that's a, that observation has merit, and, and it is challenging, but I think that there are both ways to do it and, and certainly interim steps to take towards that goal. So I, I want to, I'll, I'll address, I'll address four points. The first one, which is this gets to what the Comptroller's Office has done with their, with their boardroom accountability project is that investors should follow the lead of the New York City Comptroller's Office in trying to make the boards of fossil fuel companies climate competent. They need to be aware of climate change, have it integrated into their business models. I mean, this is, and I'll, I'll touch on additional points relating to that, but the, the you know, boardroom accountability project that, that filed, I think, with 33 fossil fuel companies to get the ability to nominate directors to these companies, it sounds a little esoteric, you know, proxy voting, but actually it's quite critical because boards are these boards run companies. And if you can get someone on board of a fossil fuel company that, that understands climate issues, I think that's a big step forward. Uh, and, and I look forward to hearing what Scott has to say about that. So boards are critical. The other pieces I would say of this package, and they all kind of they fall under the board framework, I would say are capital management, uh, executive compensation, and political lobbying touch on each of those. Capital management it really is the core of the problem. How are companies spending money? Um, oil, gas, and coal companies collectively currently spend about three to four times as much on, in, on capital expenditures, on digging up, refining, processing fossil fuels, um, as they do returning cash to shareholders, you know, in buybacks or in dividends. If we're going to move towards two degrees C, that ratio needs to switch. It needs to begin switching quickly. So again, this can sound sort of esoteric, but this is the core of the problem. Um, I know Ceres and, and others have worked on shareholder resolutions to address exactly this point at, at, at Exxon, recently at Chevron. Um, shareholder resolutions may or may not be the best way to, to try to move companies in that direction, but, but understanding how companies are committing their capital, fundamental, and probably the most important thing that an investor can do relating to climate. Second point in terms of running these companies is executive, is executive compensation. You know, how are people respond to incentives and how are you paying your executives? All the companies, if you suffer the brain damage as I've done, to go through their 10K filings and try to reconstruct their compensation formulas, there are all these different metrics. But it basically comes down to some companies put a fair amount of weight, 30%, 40% on basically rewarding executives for just digging up fossil fuels or for, you know, for getting projects online, um, that's not what you want. You, you don't want to be rewarding companies for doing that. You want to be rewarding companies for actually creating value for shareholders. And making companies, you know, try to reward companies, pardon me, reward executives for creating value rather than just digging up fossil fuels is a key point. Final point I would make is on political lobbying. This is something that, that in Europe is frequently talked about, I think is getting a view in the States. Um, you know, you have fossil fuel companies that, uh, particularly some of the larger um, oil and gas companies, there are six, six of the largest European oil and gas majors, Shell, Total, BP, you know, they all recently came out advocating for a carbon press. So the question that investors have put to these companies is if you believe in, if you believe in a carbon price, uh, why are you a member of industry bodies that actively lobby against climate legislation? And those, that discussion has, I think, borne some fruit. Just uh, three days ago, uh, Royal Dutch Shell withdrew from ALEC, which some of you may know. You know so, yeah, three days. I certainly agree with that. The American Legislative Exchange Council, which actively lobbies against climate legislation. That is a complete no-brain for any company that pays even lip service to climate change. They should not be a member of these bodies that are keeping you know, the politics frozen on climate change. So 
Um, you know, to conclude again, to me, I think I agree with everything that's been said about the magnitude of this challenge, the need to work together to try to form solutions. There are, there are a range of different strategies. And I'll just put in that for those, you know, the people in this room who are putting in their precious time and effort to try to make progress on this issue, to try to mobilize financial markets to be aligned with a climate secure future, there is certainly that divestment that has helped attract attention to the issue, that has galvanized public awareness. Um, for investors who are unlikely to embrace divestment, there are a range of other strategies that involve both being smart about what capital they put into the fossil fuel industry and where, and also being an engaged investor to try to have responsible boards, to try to have prudent capital management, executive compensation that does not reward just digging up more fossil fuels, um, you know, and, and political lobbying stances that don't thwart progress on climate policy. So I'll end it there. I want to, again, uh, kudos to everyone who has come here tonight to, to learn about and to discuss this issue and very much look forward to hearing the rest of the speakers and also the Q&A.